Hey, good morning, guys. This is Sam. Ken's on the line as well. I want to start with some news and updates. Uh, nothing big, just that um, we're going to stop with the MailChimp emails for the webinar notices. Uh, starting, well, starting this beginning of the month, maybe this month or maybe next month. And so to get information about what we're doing and what the next webinar is, go to news and updates in the software, which is why I started with um, this screen up. Just as a refresher to get there, just go to global settings, about, and then check for news and updates and it'll tell you. So, so there you have it. And I think most of you guys are regulars and you know the two week cadence. So that's usually what we follow. Okay, uh, today's topic is not so much on features functionality, it's more on stability and resolving instability. So I, re I, vamp I revamped or uh, improved the Windows systems tuning article. And the focus here is, well, let's start with the checklist. You should always start with the checklist. And you know, if you're new, most of you guys are our experts, but that being said, if you're new, uh, the first thing we, we tell you to do is after you install the software on your machine is go through the Windows system tuning article to like, just to make sure that the antivirus software and Windows is set up properly to work well with Blue Virus. So that's where I'm starting. So I'm gonna walk through that uh, just because it's mostly the same. It's been here for a while, but I made some improvements to it. So that I just wanna make you guys aware of it. So all the uh, Windows setting stuff, little tweaks here and there for, based off of feedback from Ken that we discussed earlier this week. I'm not gonna go through it word for word, but here's all the antivirus um, exclusions. Here's the firewall settings. Uh, you know, I don't walk through it in detail, but I did create an article on Windows tools articles because Windows provides a lot of stuff like, um, uh, in regards to if you got an update and you want, and you want to go back to the previous version because it's messing up your software. Uh, System Restore does that. They have other tools like you can, you can, you know, with any Windows purchase, like if you buy a PC with Windows on it, you can get a Windows ISO file and that's a clean version of Windows. And so anytime you want to just start clean, get rid of everything, you can do that. So anyways, I thought I'd document that because I do that. I have a Windows system file, I mean system Windows ISO file. I also have a Windows restore file. I also I also have system restore activated. So I have it, you know, I, I use it all. I mean, I haven't used it all, but I leverage it all because Windows provides it. And so just being aware of it and and knowing when to use what um, is Good to know, as well as when you come into problems and you just can't resolve it. I mean, sometimes it's just a Windows issue. Like there's plenty of users that have just flushed out Windows, reinstalled Windows and Blue Iris and it started working again. So that's what the Windows Tools article is about. That's kind of new. There's my mouse, here we go. Okay, and then running as a service. So all this stuff up top is about running it manually and then all the gotchas associated with running as a service. So after you install it and go through all this stuff, at this point, it should be good to go. However, you know, things do pop up over time, right? And uh, we've all been there. So a lot of this is piggybacking off of the help file. So can, you know, if you go to, the tr if you go to troubleshooting and FAQ section of help, a lot of the details, even more of the details is there as well. So this piggybacks off of that content. And I just added some more stuff with Windows events articles. So um, one thing but nice about the web is you just click and jump into different articles and jump back. So that's what kind of makes it kind of handy. But that being said, like the most common ones that you guys hit are the, the, the million zeros and five and then the zeros and three, seven, four. So just to be aware, um, some of this is helpful, some of it isn't so helpful. And what I mean by that is like this particular Windows event issue with five is more helpful just because it happened within the Blue Rice application. 
faulty module path is blue iris. So like Ken might be able to leverage the offset to like find out like where in the code that issue happened. But that being said, you know, there's so many permuta like there's so many things going on in parallel that just because you know where it happened in the code, you don't know like what tr what call that to cause the issue. So there's still a lot of variables. And I'm and that's what we're gonna talk about today is about like, yeah, this kind of helps, but it doesn't it may or may not lead to the root cause. And then there's another common one, three, seven, four, like, and I draw this one out just because it's, both of these are memory issues. And you can imagine like with video streaming, every time an, a frame comes in, you know, if a camera's cranking out 30 frames per second or 15 frames per second, every second you got all this data coming in that needs to be put into, into memory to process. So, it, it, you know, these are, memory issues, it's happening a gazillion times a second, right? And because of that, um, when you get these, uh, it's very hard to determine the, like, the root cause just based off of this alone. Um, and the reason I'm calling out the second one is just because if you look at the faulty module path, it's, it's, the, it's the Windows libraries, NTDLL. And so from here, like, obviously we don't have access to the Windows code, right, from Microsoft and we can't go to the offset and figure out what's going on. So this is even more obtuse, like, as to what the, what the, what the underlying issue is. So this is helpful, but it's not gonna be the be all end all. So it's like sending, telling us that it crashed and providing a Windows event, event log. Um, it's, you know, it's only gonna go so far. Okay, so where are we? Windows Event Viewer, so instability and crashes. So, okay, so if you're still having issues, if you did all the stuff up top and you're still having issues, um, Windows Event Viewer is where you start, first down where you end. So what has changed? I mean, that's the biggest question you have to ask yourself. So was there a Windows update? So like me, I'm, I'm always doing, you know, like I do the weekly Windows updates, it hasn't bit me, so Usually I don't suspect Windows updates can cause issues, but it has. So, uh, you know, these are anecdotals from other tickets, from other users. Um, it was cr this, this one guy said it was crashing left and right. And then he did uh, system restore and went back, rolled back the update and it went back to being quiet again. So it can happen. So just be aware of it. And this could be one, ex you know, like if you did an update and this blue ice is crashing, then that's a pretty good sign that that might be the issue. And then, and the other big gotcha could be any antivirus or firewall updates. Um, I use Windows Defender, but a lot of you guys use some of the other more savvy things, I guess. I'm not sure if they're, I'm sure if savvy is the right word, but there's other software like malware bytes and stuff. Um, those types of updates can mess up blue wires as well. And then, and if you're convinced that Blue Iris is a, is a culprit, then you know roll back. Like Blue Iris versioning article, talk, there's a ton of stuff that you can do in Blue Iris to like roll back and and save. Like I'm not gonna go through this article, but I did this in the past. You know, you can save like past versions while updating, so you can like roll back really quickly. You can go back to last stable. Like there's a ton of stuff you can do. This article tells you all the things you can do. So take advantage of it and. Um, you know, show us that rolling back resolve the issue because that's a big clue for us as well. All right, so what's some of the minimum information that is required? So like, yeah, the event viewer is, is, is a start, but as I said before, it's not, it's, not, it's not the finish line. So status, the logs is, is a key component here. So how do you get to the logs? You go to the status button, and um, I've gone through this a few times, but the arrow is gets you to the logs. So the arrow button, so this tells you the logs, the logs tab, obviously. And this rolls up. So I'm not as savvy as Ken is with deciphering this, but like, just keep in mind that there's a lot of line items associated with, like this, like the number 65 and number 12 means a delete, on the alerts folder happened 65 times um, I, I, uh, over a period of time. I, I'm not even sure the period of time. So like, I'm not as savvy as, as digesting the, the, um, 
the summary log tab because this rolls up, but uh, just keep in mind what these numbers mean. And when I use just a logs tab, I'm just looking for error. Like when this thing goes red, that's when I go in here and find out what the error was because that's of concern to me. Like anytime this is red, I go in here and, and figure stuff out. Today's topic is about the log files themselves. And that's when you open the file and where's my log file that open over here. Drag it to the other window. So this is what I'm gonna talk about today and how to digest this. Um, it's all sequential, so it's a little bit easier for me to digest, but it's also a lot of, it's a ton of stuff. Like it can be like each month could be like over 20. I'll show you the, exa the example today is it has over 200,000 lines. So how do you digest all that information is, is what this today's topic is about. Okay, so that's the logs. That's the logs. Okay, so some of the, like when you do go into logs, what are some of the questions you should ask yourself? Um, Uh, well, the only one that I usually ask is like, if there's an error, like what that error is. And then we do, pro I, well, I'm creating this article. It's a little messy, but it's kind of, it's getting more organized um, about what these errors mean. So there's a link as well. You just go to the status log errors article. And then I try to organize it by, by big buckets of topics. So deep stack errors, when they come up, what they mean and possible fixes. Um, so this is like to help you guys self-correct. So like if you find an error and um, you just, you know, even if you don't know what the subject is, like storage versus record versus deep stack, whatever, you can just scroll down and see if we've documented that error. So move file errors. There's different types and there's different fixes for each type. So there's NAS errors. So this is getting more and more flushed out with errors, with fixes. and um, so this gives you a clue if you see an error yourself, like what does it mean? Well, now you, now you, can, now you, now you can kind of figure it out and hopefully there's a fix associated with it as well. So there's a lot of stuff here. I'm not gonna go through all of it obviously, but you can read through it when you come to an error that you have. And when I go through a specific log ticket today, you'll see exactly how I use it. Okay. Okay, so that's where the status log errors are to interpret errors when you see them in the logs. And then the most important thing is oftentimes you guys will copy, you know, put this in the, uh, in the ticket. Well, this, after it restarts, this thing start the, the log tab starts fresh again. So <laughs> what's more important is what happened before, you know, before it crashed, right? Like what was it doing that caused the crash? And so this is not of use if you're trying to like figure out like why it's becoming inst 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 unstable, right? So uh, that's what bullet two is about, the status log before the crash, that's important. So common mistake is you send the screenshot of the, of the logs and we need the stuff before it. So that's why when you have to open the file and go to the bottom of it. So fortunately, it's fairly easy to find out what happened before a crash because all you have to do, where my blue wires go? There we go. Go to the status button. It's, they're just buttons, you know, open file. Uh, first of all, make sure you save the file because if you're not saving the logs then, um, there's no log files that are open, right? So make sure that's checked. And then open file, it goes, it just goes to the last month. And then if you wanna know what, what caused, just caused a crash, just go to the bottom. You know, my, my machine hasn't crashed in a long time, but you just go to the bottom and then you'll see a whole, whole bunch of errors on the bottom. I'll show you an example coming up, but basically you just go to the bottom and then you'll know the stuff that what Blue Wires was doing before the crash. Okay. And then look at the other stuff in the status button because that might give you clues as well because this, this thing pretty much summarizes how the server is behaving. So my cameras are off, so all those stats are off, but like, it'll tell you how the cameras are doing. This is like more security stuff, like who's, who's um, connected and 
how people are accessing your server. Storage is important. I kind of, let me review this once more time because <laughs> I was looking at my last webinar, and I kind of messed this up. So the bottom line is telling you how much, how much of your drive have you allocated towards um, for Blue Iris. So a total of 130 gigs is allocated Blue Iris and that's distributed across the new stored alerts and faces directories. And 60 of the 130 has been used. So how do I, how do I know this? So uh, where the 130 come from? Well, you can just, you can, you can do the math yourself. Uh, it's, it's all just, just simple math. So the new has a hundred gigs. That's the new, it's the same directory. That's why it's all combined. Stored is, is zero, alerts is 20 and faces a 10. Everything else is zero. Oh, this is five, but it's not used. All right, so <laughs> if, I place the, if I place the directory here, then the five would be counted, but since I blanked it out, this is not being used. So like this five is not being, Blue Iris knows that this is not a real directory because I haven't specified a location. So he, Blue Iris knows that this five is not, is not relevant. Like it would probably be clear if I just put zero, but it was at five, so whatever. Um, so that's how you know, like based off of the directory and the size, you just do the math. So this is new is 100, stored is zero, alerts is 20, and faces is 10. So 130, and that's basically what Blue Iris did. So 130 has been allocated for Blue Iris. I never use faces. I, I use alerts a little bit. I never use stored, but Blue Iris doesn't know that. But uh, that being said, um, that's, how the, that's how the math came up. And this 60 is like my, you know, I have, I have recordings. And so 60 of it's being used. So now the top one, this is the whole drive. So this is a slice, this is a slice that Blue Wires takes up from my drive. So I have other stuff in the drive. Like, I don't know what, I'll, what other stuff I have in my drive. I can't remember, but like, whatever. Like I have a whole bunch of other things in it. And um, so of the drive, the drive is 500 gigs, 491, you know, like it's formatting and stuff like that. So 500 gigs. And then 217, like from here to here is 217 is used up. And from here to here is free. Uh, 273 and the 204 is the green. So like if I wanted to crank, give more space to Blue Iris, like build, build this out even more, I have plenty of, of space to do that, 204 gigs. So I can, like news at hundred, I can put 200 and I, I'm, still, I'm still good, right? Because I have 204. So that's what it's telling you. So, so that's, hope that's more clear than <laughs> what I did last time. Deep stack, I'm not gonna go through, but I talked about this and remote management, um, I haven't played with yet. Okay, so that's a little bit of an aside, but okay. So that's the status button. Understand the log file. This is what I'm gonna deep dive into. I'm gonna, I'm gonna work through a ticket and how to deal with logs, especially a big log. Uh, I'll table that for now, I'll come back to it. And then once you get to here, you have at least now, at this point, you know that you set up your servers correctly. All the antivirus and firewall stuff is set. You're still having issues. You don't know if it, you might, it might be a Windows update. So now you know how to go back, um, but you still might be having issues. And um, now you know how to go through the logs to you know, figure out what your server's doing to give more clues as to what, what the issue could be, right? All right, so that's where we're at. So here's some basic concepts, immediate crashes. So like if it crashes in the first five, 15 minutes, like the, the anecdotal for the, um, the Windows update, this guy's kept crashing like every 15 minutes. So those types of things uh, almost never has to do with Blue Iris. It has to do with your hardware. It has to do with the Windows update, something external to Blue Iris that Blue Iris depends on. So, you know, turn off your, so these to do's is like, turn off your hardware acceleration. I'm not gonna go through all the details. It's kind of boring, just read through it. But that's the basic bucket, like immediate crashes, thinks something else is messing up, is messing with Blue Iris to prevent Blue Iris from functioning correctly. The intermittent crashes is, 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 the, is uh, the ones that we're more concerned about. Like if it's been running for two or three days, which is a ticket I'm gonna talk about, um, and this, the ticket I'm, I'm going to talk about, the server was running fine for like, you know, 21 days and then it crashed. 
So those are things that um, are in of real interest to us just because um, there could be something there that, um, you know, we could have overlooked some, you know, some setting, some functionality between Windows and Blue Iris that is causing that, or it could it could also be an external factor. Um, so these types of issues um, is more concerning to us just because um, it could be something that we've overlooked. You know, like you know, you only know so much until you experience an issue, right? And then, um, and so. So resolving these types of issues also hardens the software tremendously. So uh, uh, that's why we were focusing on it today as well as um, in general. And then final thoughts, you know, show some patience here because yeah, it's possible that there's an issue with Blue Iris, but the reality is like we have hundreds of thousands of users, right? And so, yeah, there might be a particular issue with your setup and your hardware and Blue Iris. Uh, if it was pervasive, um, and it was, you know, uh, seen by many users, we would know way before you would because the tickets would just, you know, pile in, right? So just keep that in mind. And other golden nuggets in, in Blue Iris is these system alerts. Like you can go to, this, you can create alerts anytime Blue Iris is, is identifying issues. And so if you're near your machine all the time, um, this is kind of good to have. So status alerts, like you can get alerted every time software restarts or anytime there's an error. Um, so take advantage of that because that'll help you like in real time, like when the issue happens, um, address, address the problem and get more clues as to what the problem is. And there's some the main tickets. I'm not gonna go into this. So I, I'm gonna, clarify this, like some people think these are all questions they have to answer. And that's not the, that's not the idea here. The idea here is like to help you think about like things to help, you know, you, you, you become curious to like isolate the issue. Like, um, so based off of some of these questions, it, it should prop, it should help you provide a more meaningful ticket when you submit the ticket. So what I mean by that is what we need from your, from the actual ticket is to describe the issue. So like, once you start asking these questions to yourself, the issue, the, the description issue, the issue will hopefully be more more detailed than uh, my my blue iris crashes every fifteen minutes. <laughs> so that's that's the idea here. So uh, and you can go through all those details later because that's it's you know you just read it and follow it. Okay, so what I wanted to discuss today is how do you digest a pretty heavy duty log log file. So I'm gonna go back to here. This is where I'm at. Oh wait, I finished all of this, all the settings. I'm going back to here, like understanding the log files. So storage and recording issues. So this, um, this was interesting, like I said before, because it happened, it didn't happen right away. It happened like over a period of times, which is why I kind of got into it because um, it was kind of interesting. So when there are issues with Blue Eye Server, the log files are a good place to start to understand the problem. The purpose of this article is to provide example of how we use logs in order to get hints as to the underlying issue. This article provides guidance on how to examine the log files. There are many causes for, for a server crash or poor performance. This article should at least allow you to diagnose and self-correct or provide key information to help support that to help support the di to help support diagnose the issue, sorry. <laughs> so, so this is the guidelines. So like, you know, this is a particular issue for a particular ticket. I'm gonna have more of these over time. Um, I do have more in, that I haven't documented yet as well, but this will grow out, you know, based on the different buckets of, of status log errors, you'll see more and more examples. So it'll help you figure out what's going on with your machines. But that being said, you gotta start somewhere. So we'll start, with, we'll start off with this ticket. So what was the issue? All right, I found this ticket interesting because the problem didn't appear immediately. It took several days of running before the problem appears. This user had a small, medium-sized server load with 14 cameras, not huge, not small. The July log file shared for diagnosing issue had 200,000 lines from July 1st to July 20th. So this, you know how the logs get created every month um, that's, that's why July 1st, and then it crashed on July 20th, and that's when he sent it over to us. 
So I'll show you the log file. So it's a, uh, you know, it's a, it's a ton of stuff, right? Um, yeah, I, I can keep scrolling like this and it barely moves this thing, right? So, so how do you deal with this thing, right? That's the question. Okay, so what did I do? So from this information, all I knew from the ticket was this. From this information, I knew there's probably an issue with global settings, clips and, archi clips and archiving. This means there should be storage and recording errors. So from the, t from the issue, um, I kind of figured out that it had to be something with storage and recordings. And now that I had this article on all the different errors by buckets, I kind of knew that it ha the, there had to be move file errors, maybe NAS errors, or maybe recording errors like, like this stuff. So that's kind of like where I started off with like, uh, do I see any clip disk fulls or move errors, stuff like that. That's all I really knew, right? All right, so from there, the logs happen to begin with camera connectivity errors. So like, if, if you go to the top of the log, there's all these signal reset for these, these, this camera HVAC, um, but this ticket's about storage. So you have to know what to dive into, what not to dive into. So like dealing with camera stuff isn't, a, isn't the cause of the crash. So I you know ignore it. So know what to look for versus it's just as important to know what to avoid looking, you know, diving deep into because it's not going to resolve the issue. Okay. The user state of the logs were created since the last crash. I went to the end of the logs and confirmed many, many clip just full errors at the end of the logs. Thus, I knew these logs contained a point of time where the server was functional and created and and crash due to storage recording issues as the user stated, the log should tell me the problem. So the beginning doesn't tell me much, right? It's all this like camera stuff. So I went to the end and boom, there's all these, you know, record errors, these clip just full. So I knew someone in these logs, it should tell me like the server was working at the top, the server crashed at the bottom and it has a record and storage errors that that the user is reporting. So this log should tell me the story, right? So that was good. So I, I figured like there's some something in here that's gotta tell me something, right? Okay, so that's the bottom. So then I went back to the top of the log and I started scrolling down, scanning for storage and record errors. After scrolling through several pages, I saw the below common pattern repeatedly. So. I didn't really know what to do because you know I'm kind of new at doing doing this as well. So I just started scrolling down, right? It was all like the same kind of stuff, like the signal stuff, and then I would see these move and deletes. So I'm not sure why, but I was like, I, I I guess I guess right, but like I figured to track this. <laughs> um, so what is this telling me? So like his his archiving is pretty simple. He's got new stored and alerts. That's it. And new the new folder. Is is moving files? You know, it's, I guess the cap is 600 gigs that he has for new, and he's got 327 gigs free on on his hard drive, and uh, and it was successful. So like the move happened, they did the move, and then stored, deleted three items, and alerts did nothing. Maybe he's got nothing in alerts. Who knows? Um, so. I just started tracking this, so like, are the move? I just wonder, like, are the moves happening? Uh, and it seems like they're happening. So I started searching for move. I think that's my next step. So once I knew this pattern, the clips and archiving settings were fairly simple, new to stored. I also started observing that the new after that new after the successful moves would hover around 328 gigs. So I, I, I focus on the number. Like, is that thing is that thing decreasing or increasing? So then I was like, well, maybe I, maybe I got a clue. So I started searching for move, right? Control F, move. So I said, I'll go to the next one. But the damn file is so big, I kept pounding through this for like, you know, like a good minute or two. And I wouldn't get past this, this the first day. Like I would see this thing like not move very far. So like this wasn't working. Like, oh my gosh, like I'll be doing this forever, right? So... I started with the move. Since the log files were so large, I simply started searching for the next move command, 
With Surge, I quickly pounded through all the move commands, observing what the new remained at 328 gigs. So like while I was doing this, I just kept making sure that the amount available on the drive was staying around 328. And it was. It was like 327, 330, blah, blah, blah. But even with Surge, getting through all the move commands in just one day took several, several clicks. I then, cl I then scrolled down by the day. So that's what really helped. So like, so do, after this got got old and tiring, I just July first, right? So, so then I would scroll down to July, you know, I would scroll down to July, like it's a ton of stuff, right? So I scroll down to July second. Yeah, look at all this just for one day. Here's July second, and then I would go Control F, I would search for the move again, and it was still hovering around 327. 3.30, like, you know, I pounded through a, a couple, like, you know, so I'm, I'm, I'm thinking to myself, well, okay, July 2nd is good. So then I would go to July 3rd. So it was tedious. It's a lot of stuff, but that's what I ended up doing. July 3rd. So I did the same thing, like, for the, I look for the moves. I'll do one. Again, it was fine, 329 gigs. So I kept doing that. It was tedious, I, I won't lie to you. So finally on July 19th, I found the first move error, the needle in the haystack. So here it was, um, uh, move file errors. I, see, the move tried to do two, and then there were two move file errors. So like both those files were bounced, like it didn't, it didn't go through. This was, this was line 147,021 in the log file. Notice how free storage for the first time dropped below 327 gigs. So this is the first time it dropped below 327. Not much, but it's the first time it did. So that was a red flag too. So looking back, so now that I did this once, I, I would probably have started from the bottom and worked my way back up <laughs> instead of like from the top down. Uh, but you know, you only know what you know when you, when you first do it, right? You learn more as, with experience. All right, so that's when, and so then I kept pounding down the moves. I kept seeing the, the drive, 326, 320, 315. It would go down and then at the bottom of it, it was down to 4K. So here's like the last one before it crashed, 4K free. So it was eating up storage, right? So this is what I provided as the analysis report. From here, it was apparent via Blurize kind of move files to stored and would eventually fill up the new driving crash. Analysis report below. Everything seems to be running okay in the beginning, continues working on, until July 19th. That's when I noticed the first issue. Um, this is the one before it failed and this is the right after. So on July 19th, 7.32, I became, I became very specific were my first move file errors. And then from there on, I just kept going down and then eventually blue eye snapshots, you know, I'm down to 10 gigs. Uh, this is 10 gigs was eaten up. And then right before it crashed, there was only 4K left on the drive. So the question is why is blue eye stop, why did blue eye stop communicating with the NAS on July 19th? So, so what's the answer? Like the ticket is still not resolved. Like Ken added, Ken's adding more details to logs to gather more information to help out this user. The user reaching out to the forum of the NAS vendor as well. Like, I mean, clearly Blue Iris isn't gonna change, it, change its instructions in, on July 19th and not. It's gonna do the same thing on July 19th as it did on July 18th and 17th. So the user is fairly comfortable that it has something to do with the NAS. So he's looking at the, the logs in the NAS and then if he needs some support from us, you know, Ken's willing to help and provide those log details. So that's, um, that's where it's at right now. And then uh, I closed the analysis report, like, you know, like whatever, uh, whatever other things I found, like I told the guy, like um, the HVAC camera is kind of messed up because it keeps disconnecting. You should deal with that with the no signal article. So I added some other stuff as well. So that's what I want to share. So like, you know, the logs can be a little bit daunting, a little bit huge, a little bit tedious but that's the way you can start thinking about digesting it. Okay, good, half an hour, that's it. That's all I took. Um, that's all I had.
Ken, did you want to chime in? Did I miss anything? Any other tidbits? Oh, I forgot your golden nugget. So Ken's, when I was discussing with Ken, uh, I'll, I'll add this to the to that article, but um, with NAS in general, uh, one gotcha is the bit rates. Um, all right, I'm gonna, I'll, it's a little bit complicated. So uh, the basic idea is like, you got a whole bunch of cameras and it's dumping into your new folder. So that's one bucket. And then you got to move all that stuff. If, you, if you're using a NAS, the NAS is considered, think of that as another bucket. So if you can, if your drive can record faster than your, your NAS can be written to in terms of bit rates, um, you can blow up your NAS eventually just be, you can blow up your new drive eventually because more stuff is coming into new than it can dump out to NAS. And so that the new buck is gonna fill up. That's the basic idea. But I'll document there's a gotcha for, for NASs in this article. Okay, that's my last point. Can you sleeping? You still there? <laughs> yeah, I'm just, uh, just listening to you. Uh, great job. Uh, you just open up the questions if you don't um, have any, anything else. Okay. All right. I see people chiming in. So, Mike Barford, allowed to talk. Mike's on mute. Any other raised hands? Oh, there's a whole bunch. Are you answering the questions in the QA? I've answered a few. Yep. Um, oh, they, just... None of them are really related yet to uh, to what we've been talking about, so I've just been uh, answering yeah. those on the side. Okay, okay, no worries. I see a lot of stuff in chat. Happy Friday! I set my HD limit at twenty eight with crazy. Oh, so. Uh, I guess somebody else has a similar issue where it goes over the limits specified by Blue Iris. So now you know why, like um, that means like when they're trying to do a move, uh, there's a permissions issue or something, wherever you're trying to move to is not allowing it. And so that's why the new folder is getting filled. That's the basic idea. It, it, it's almost always permission issues. Um, but I'll just open up a ticket. We can't really go into more detail than that, but that's the basic concept. Consider changing the log file name to, oh, that's a good tip. I like that. Uh, if you guys are looking at the chat, if you don't want, if you want to break it down by weekly instead of monthly to like make the logs more digestible. Um, James, thanks for sharing that. That's a, that's a, that's a good idea. Russ, a lot of talk. Unmute. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, I have a question that's not related to the subject today, but um, it's I haven't been able to find it on your forums or any Q and A's or anything. Um, I've got all Amtras cameras. All indoor cameras are two megapixel and four megapixel. They're all they're all brand new within a year. Uh, I just installed five brand new five megapixel cameras outside. Um, I'm dual streaming everything, um, which keeps my CPO real nice and, and cool. However, when I go to play back a clip, all I can see is substream. Um, I'm wondering, I, I, I went to a, a mainstream on my outdoor cameras because those are my most important, just so I could play back um, the mainstreams. Um, I'm not sure if it's just a simple setting that I need to go to, but uh, um, I, I just don't know what to do. All my indoor cameras are, are dual stream, but my playback when I click, click on a clip is just the low resolution substreams. Yeah, so yeah. <laughs> I was just talking to Ken about this this week. Uh, this got me too. So like if you have dual stream, you have to use direct to disk to get, uh, to, get okay. to work with high resolution playback. Okay, so, so that's one thing. So if it's directed, are you doing direct to disc? That's, that's first no, gotcha. Not. 
Okay. No, I'm not. So that's your problem. But that being said, once you do that, another gotcha, another common gotcha is uh, you, you, can, you can choose. Uh, use self if available. So if you want the high resolution, uh, you have to toggle that in, in the playback window. Oh, stop playing. Okay. okay. Uh, so if you, if you right click on the playback window, Okay, right click uh, on the playback window. Okay. Make sure you substream if, if available is unselected if you want the high resolution playback. That's all I'm saying. Okay. Uh, but I think your problem is direct to disk. Like um, that's the, <laughs> that's important. Uh, okay, so I'm gonna record. I have oh, to go so, yeah. to record. Video file format and compression and then direct to disk, okay. Yeah. Hmm. All right, and that'll solve that problem. <laughs> because yeah. I really do like I, I really do like to use this the substreams the dual streams because it keeps my CPU running nice and cool. So yeah, I think uh, I think Ken only decodes the uh, because he's got to use the substream for motion. Well, I'm guessing here he's got to use that for motion detection. So like I think the only thing that's decoded if you don't if you have substreams and you do reencode, um, only thing that's decoded is the substream, and therefore that's the only thing that's recorded. That's why you're only getting substream playback. Anyways, uh, that, that's okay. a fix. Yeah. I'll give that a shot. Appreciate it. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, let's see. It's not moving anywhere. I'm going for oh, this is Scott again. Hey, Scott, like, um, uh, we, yeah, we can't dive into like a specific issue like uh, on this broad broad call, but you can open up a ticket and we can go into it if you can't solve it yourself. Let's start with the logs and see like where it's breaking. Like um, why? I mean, you you got to be having move file errors if um if uh your one of your drives is filling up. So that's like the first part of it. Any other questions? Here we go, Robert, a lot of talk. Oops, did I hit the right person? Oh yeah, go ahead, Robert, yeah. Yeah, I've got a slightly off topic question. Um, is there a way within the UI3 or Blue Iris app to kind of scroll back recent video? Uh, for example, yesterday I ended up seeing some suspicious activity on my camera, and I just wanted to kind of scroll back in that video, like the past five minutes, to make sure I didn't see somebody get out of a certain vehicle or something like that. And I didn't see a way of doing it without going actually onto my Blue Iris server and doing it that way. Oh, you want like in the live view, right? Yeah, basically like a live view, but. If I'm away or something like that, I would either use the Blue Iris app or I would use the UI3, which I have set up to give access remotely. Uh, but I don't have the, I don't set it up where I can do like an RDP from the outside unless I do like a VPN. But it's just like, it's something like that. If I want to kind of scroll back in the recent video, I don't really see a way of doing that. And I'm not sure if I'm missing it or if it's just something that's not possible. Are you recording continuous? Yes. Oh, then you're fine. You can just uh, so go to clips, um, whichever camera you're trying to go back on, like say it's 80. Let me turn my cameras on so it's more. Well, I don't have continuous, but anyways, let's see how far I can get on this. So here's a live view. If you go to clips and then I select it and then I go to not alert towards clips. Here's new. I guess you get a new. And then here's the. So it, um, I'm not recording continuous, but correct me if I'm wrong, Ken. If he was, then the top clip would be the current clip, right? And you just play that and go back, right? Uh, once again, trying to do three things at once, but um, yeah, this is. 
it's presented in reverse time order, so the newest one is at the top for sure. Okay. I thought that? that was something that it finished, and I didn't know if it was something that was like the current one it's running. I always kind of looked at that as that's what had happened before, and I thought I had to wait like an hour or something like that for it to finish. No, no, no. You can read and write. The Blue Rise can read and write at the same time. So if you go to the camera and then go to your new folder, and the top one will be the, um, the one that's recording right now. Okay. And then you can That's, ex that's yeah. exactly what I needed to know. Okay, cool. Thank you. You're welcome. I think some questions came in my inbox. Let's see, I don't want to put that there. Camera cycle in the UI. When I choose the option, all cameras cycle. Okay, this is an auto cycle question. Since it's quiet, I might as well go through it. Is there a way to show individual camera cycle instead of camera groups? Yes. So auto cycle, um, if you have groups, uh, you can choose. Uh, so if I want to auto cycle in the ADF cameras group, that's that's easy. Just let me hide the disabled ones. Hide disabled cameras. Here we go. If I go to auto cycle, and then it'll just pop through each one. So that's how you go from camera to camera in a group. This is auto cycle, guys. Just a refresher. Um, and then if you want to. Regardless of groups, you want to auto cycle on all the cameras. Um, unfortunately, all the all my other cameras are disabled, so it's not going to show. Um, like customers, oh, where is it? Can't even see them. Huh? Interesting. So all my other cameras are disabled, so I can't. It's not going to show anything differently. But if you want to like. Uh, auto cycle on the all cameras group, that's fine too. Oh, it's going through the group, sorry. Oops, I got to turn this, oh, I got to turn it off. Hold on a second. Sorry, sorry. So let me go to all cameras, participating group cycle. No, okay. I just got to hold, I think as a long press it. Oh, here we go. I think I was, um, what was I doing? What was different? What, took a while to start, but it did. All cameras. So you don't you don't do a single press, you do a long press. And then click on one of them. That's all you yeah, that's all you have to do. Okay. So all cameras and just auto cycle. That's it. There you go. Okay. That was a pending question. That was like a review. Any other questions? I guess not quite a one new message. Would be super helpful to paste your forum links for the webinar here in the chat at the B. Oh, that's a good idea. Thanks, Aaron. That's a good idea. <laughs> I'll do that right now. It's a little bit late, but uh, it's a good idea though. Okay, guys, uh, final questions, if any, going once, twice. Oh, here we go. Alan, a lot of talk. There was something in the chat about changing the log file name um, 
to make weekly and send monthly log files. Was that a suggestion to Ken or was that something we're supposed to be able to do? Because I went into Blue Iris and I can't change the name of the log file. The field is locked and I can't figure out how to get it unlocked. Oh, I thought I thought that was a suggestion that was available. Um... Yeah, in that window, when I click in that box, I can't change the text. Oh, you're right. I can change the folder, but it doesn't look like I can change the file name. Yeah, you're right. I can't do it either. Hey, Ken, how do I add that weekly? Make it weekly instead of monthly? Uh, right now, you can only select the, uh, the folder in the current version. Um, so is this Bruce who's on there? Uh, no. Uh, Bruce was asking a question in the chat about something similar. How do you change the log file name? Um, right now, uh, you can only select the folder, and it uh, creates a monthly log. Um, I'll open that up so that you can edit that. Yeah, I mean, James, this is James LeMay. He said, like, you can do percent %w to go weekly yeah. or something. I guess yeah. that was there before. Um, they, well, there was a bug before. You were able to select a file, and if you selected a file, then you would lose that formatting. And then that's that one person uh, wrote in chat that they had uh, everything going to one file since May. And that's probably the reason they used the dot, dot, dot button and selected a file. Um, so that's why I changed that. You can no longer select the file, you select the folder. Um, but I see the problem the file name is now not editable, which you may want to alter that. Maybe you want it once per week or per day or something. So I will uh, open that up to be edited in the next version. Oh, OK. All right. Thanks, Ken. And Sam, um, unrelated question, just um, it's not worth pursuing if it's just me, but maybe it's not just me. For a couple of weeks now, I had my Blue Iris configured not to require authentication on LAN connections so that I could open a browser on you know my laptop on the Wi-Fi on the LAN and just uh, open up UI3 without having to put in a username and password. Lately, it has been prompting me for a password, even though I have uh, I have that you know not required for LAN. Um, it could be it could be just me. If so, not worth taking up time to to fix it. But I'm wondering if if anyone else starts seeing that also within the last few weeks. Where is that setting? Is that here or is that a user setting? Uh, it's require from up top. The top drop down. Uh, oh, okay, got it, got it. Right, so I have it set for non LAN only. Oh, right, and right. yet I'm still getting prompted for username and password. Um, I, di I didn't used to. So either either I changed some other related setting in Blue Iris and didn't realize it was going to have that effect, or something weird is going on with my network that it's refusing to recognize that I'm on the same subnet. But um, gotcha. Uh, I don't have an answer right now. I, I don't know <laughs> if Ken does. You might have to open up a ticket on that one. Yeah, it's not annoying enough to even to have you guys track it down if it's just me. Because if other people aren't experiencing it, then it's probably just some weird configuration on my network, and I can live with it. You're the first one to mention it to me, at least. Okay. Okay. Well, we'll keep an eye on it. Like, um, yeah, I don't know right now. Thanks, Alan. Oh, more can raise hands all of a sudden. Okay. Stan, a lot of talk. Uh, Josh, a lot of talk. Whoever chimes in first, guys. Yeah, this is in reference to Alan's issue. Uh, I, it was happening to me a while back, and I resolved it by putting my laptop's IP address in the limit access by IP address field. And it resolved the issue. I was able to... to log in without a username and password at that point. And is your is your laptop was it on the same subnet as your blue iris? Like was there anything you know funky about your oh, network? I've got I've got weird network set up for remote secured remote access. Oh I see I see you have other stuff with your firewall and stuff. Right. Okay okay all right, Alan, you, you can try that, I guess. You can yeah, I, I might just to experiment, see if I have the same effect. I'm not sure that I want to limit by IP because there there is one access I do sometimes where I'm not controlling, you know, where I am actually coming in from the internet and it could be from some IP I can't predict. But I can at least play with that and see what it does. 
Okay. Thanks for sharing. Um, who was that? Stan. Thanks, Dan. Okay, five till. Any other questions, guys? If not, um, uh, going once, I would do would do one more time. One, going once, going twice. All right. Well, I guess we'll close early. Um, Ken, closing thoughts uh, before we leave. As I say every time, thanks for attending. And have a great weekend. <laughs> well said. Yeah. Okay. Bye, guys. Yeah.